Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention during this Advent season to this great prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, we pray that the exposition of your word would be accurate and honoring to you, but that the hearing and receiving and listening and applying of this word to our own lives would be transformative for us. So place such anointing towards such end upon these moments that we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in an Advent series, and it started a few weeks ago, talking about the story of Christmas being real simple, and we had to go back to the garden to explain in Genesis chapter 3 how man sinned, and then last week we talked about some promises from Isaiah chapter 7 and Genesis 3.15 and Matthew, the fulfillment of those prophecies. Today the prophets are foretold, and Isaiah is the prince of prophets, the most significant from the Old Testament, the most often quoted in the New Testament. And next week, the people anticipating, that'll be Isaiah chapter 42, and Pastor David will be preaching that text, and then we'll gather together in Luke chapter 2 on Christmas Eve, and then on Christmas Day. So today, it's the prophets foretold. We are a people, and you can go anywhere on planet Earth to any ethnic group, any group of people living in any geographical, uh, geographical area, any nation uh, in the world, any people group. We want peace, and we are saddened and disheartened by the presence of war. Some have suggested that there are ten wars taking place in the world right now, eight conflicts, the Arab-Israeli conflict being one of those conflicts, and then dozens and dozens and dozens of minor conflicts or mini wars, if you you will, between people in different areas around the world. If you like to read history and as far back as you can go in written history and the telling of human history all over planet Earth, in many ways history has to do with the history of wars. This last week celebrating or remembering the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor and some of the remaining veterans, the history of our own country, World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the list goes on and on. We turn on our TVs and we see the influence of war when we look at the streets of Aleppo in Syria and other parts of the world and our hearts are broken and saddened and we long for peace on planet Earth. Where and when will that peace ever come? And why, after all these years of quote-unquote human development, is there still war and brokenness and evil? We talked about that during these past few weeks. We live in a fallen, spiritually dark world. And so where do we turn? During this Advent season, we turn to God and we turn to His Word. Amen? And as believers and followers of Jesus, we find great encouragement and comfort when we turn to God and His Word. And so for our exposition, we want to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, and I'll read the text in two halves, the first five verses. And these five verses talk about the age of a Messiah and uh, the fact that there is coming a time. There is coming a time, your first of two main points this morning, there is coming a time. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Now, when we talk about any passage in the Bible, we always talk about it in its original context. And before I read it, I just want to do this physically, okay? Here is 700s B.C., the 8th century B.C., when Isaiah is writing and speaking, okay? So there's an original context for Isaiah chapter 9 and the application there. When prophets spoke, they often pointed to the future, and sometimes there was an immediate application, there was a future application, and there might be a far distant future application. So we're going to talk about Isaiah 9 and some of the immediate 
truth, but then we fast forward ahead. Here we are. It's Advent. We have Advent wreaths and Christmas songs, and we're preparing to celebrate. And during this whole month, we're reflecting on Advent passages and the first Advent or the first coming of Jesus. But when we do that, we also jump ahead. We're 2,000 years later, and we're standing here, and we're looking back, and all along people are asking, there's war, where is peace? There's war, where is peace? I'm testing the cameraman. There's war, where is peace? (laughs) They're chuckling back there too. (laughs) And we wonder, 2,000 years later, we sing about peace at Advent, but peace, peace, where is there peace? And we need to look beyond the now to the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom, where ultimately there will be peace. So with that picture in mind, allow me to read Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 5. There's coming a time. That time is the age or the dawn of the Messiah that's being proclaimed by Isaiah, that's being instituted, inaugurated, welcomed into in the coming of Jesus during this season of Christmas. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he who brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Many of you remember the story of Gideon and the Midianites and God telling them, fewer men, fewer men, fewer men, so that God can receive the glory and the victory. For every boot of the trampling, tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So these opening five verses, in my mind, are clearly talking to the people of Israel and pointing ahead to a future time as well. There's a back then and a not yet kind of approach to the prophecy that's here. To us, a child is born. There's coming a time, and when the Messiah comes, he will institute, he will inaugurate, he will introduce, he'll he'll give us a taste of true peace that comes into the world 2,000 years ago that we can experience now, but it's only a taste of what will be there in the future. And in each of these three settings, back then, for the people then, right now, at uh, the time when Jesus is born 2,000 years ago, and in the future, there are some truths that come from the text. Notice three of them in these first five verses. The first is a diffusing of despair. A diffusing of despair. You see that? The people have walked in darkness. They've seen a great light. Isaiah is proclaiming to the people of Israel then, and as he thinks ahead to the Messiah, a hope that delivers from darkness. One of my favorite feels of the Advent and Christmas season is this contrast of dark and light. Dark and light. When we have concerts on Christmas Eve, dark and light, there's darkness. And one of the things we know physically about darkness is it's always dispelled when light comes on. Amen? It's always dispelled. And that darkness that in one sense feels peaceful and we're together and we're in the dark also in the negative way or in the negative sense is uh, the darkness that's in our world. The gloom and the despair and the war and the difficulty and the brokenness that's there. The people have walked in darkness ever since Genesis 3. During Isaiah's time in the 700s B.C., during the time when the Messiah came, during these last 2,000 years, people live and walk in darkness, and yet there's a great light. There's a great light that's going to come to Galilee of the nations. Why is that mentioned here? And if you held your finger here in Isaiah 9 and you turned over to Matthew chapter 4, you'll see a direct fulfillment of this passage 
Matthew pens it for us. And when Jesus' ministry begins in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist been, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Matthew records this, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. You're reading that. Matthew's readers, we're reading it and we're going, whoa, 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 familiar words, familiar words. And then right into the prophecy of Isaiah, the land of Zebulun, the land of Nathali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. You know, it's interesting to think about this just for a brief moment. We know why Mary and Joseph travel when she's pregnant with Jesus down to Bethlehem. That is not puzzling to us at all. Why? Because there's a census. It's not a counting of the numbers of people, but it's a paying of taxes. Everybody in Bethlehem is related. They all have the same last name. It's a tiny village. They own property in Bethlehem, and they're going there to pay taxes. We should not be surprised why Mary and Joseph end up traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem because their relatives are there and they're paying taxes on property that they own and so on. That's not a puzzle to us. We also know why they go there because it too is a direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies that say the Messiah is not going to be born in Nazareth. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So we know that reality. But many over the years have asked the question, what are Mary and Joseph and their parents doing up in Nazareth? I think one suggested possibility is this, that the little village of Nazareth sits up on the Nazareth Ridge and it looks down over the Jezreel Valley. And the Jezreel Valley is where all of the ancient armies of civilization had to travel. If you travel from Europe to Africa to Asia, any of those three, that wasn't me, I didn't ding, who dinged? That was a really loud ding, so got your attention, didn't it? Ding! Pay close attention to this point. He's making a really good point, okay? So you had to travel, and when Mary and Joseph and their parents were looking down over the Jezreel Valley, you know what they're looking over? You want to watch him fix that? You're not paying attention. You're looking at what Dorcom's doing. <laughs> Is it going to blow sometime? Or? By the way, continue to pray for Dorcom. He has not uh, been able to get his voice back. He can talk and he can sing, but he can't do his whole, whole range. And since we've got a little distraction here anyway, um, just be praying for him. Grateful to Ryan and the ladies and others who've been leading in worship during this, this last month. Dorcom, you know, if you don't get your voice back, you have to have a voice to sing, but you don't have to have a voice to preach. You might end up becoming a preacher. So <laughs> that'll be motivation to get your voice back, huh? He's going to get into an ENT here soon and find out exactly what's going on. But seriously, uh, be praying for him. So we shouldn't be puzzled why Mary and Joseph are down in Bethlehem. One suggested possibility as to why they're in Nazareth and why their parents are there is because they're living perhaps with some sense of expectation that as the empires of the world come traveling through this, perhaps the Messiah would come. Jesus growing up was looking down over the battleground of human history. The one who would bring peace and the end of war was looking into a valley where many, many ancient wars took place. Some of us have suggested that might be one reason why Jesus and his parents are up in the area of Galilee. Galilee of the nations. The superhighway comes through here. And the Messiah and his parents eventually are growing up in that area. Why does the Messiah come? He comes to diffuse despair. He also comes to deliver joy. Verse 3, I read it emphatically. Joy, rejoice, joy, glad. When Messiah comes, when this messianic age is introduced, when the Savior of the world comes, there will be a delivering of joy that frees us from oppression. What kind of oppression? The oppression that plagues our sinful souls. That's the kind of joy that he brings, a delivering of joy and the illustration of the harvest. If you've grown up in agricultural areas, there's always excitement in the midst of the hard work at the harvest time. We got the harvest in. Or unfortunately, when there are battles and the winner uh, wins and the loser loses, the winner comes in and plunders the stuff that's left over and it replenishes their coffers and their food and their resources. Nonetheless, there's great joy when the battle is over. 
There's coming a time introduced in his first advent where despair is diffused. There's hope. There's light in the midst of darkness. There's joy. And ultimately, there will be a dispelling of war in verses 4 and 5. I'll not read it again. There's always joy when there is no war. Uh, I talked last week about chapter 7 just briefly. You read chapter 8, and chapter 8 is the coming Assyrian invasion. A pending war. We touched on that last week. I mentioned it again here. Chapter 8 is a prophecy of war coming. And then you have chapter 9. And we're told, Isaiah, to the people of Israel then and to the time when Christ would come, that when Messiah comes, there will be a dispelling of war. It's very interesting to pause and think about Israel as a nation, God's chosen people, in the land of Israel or Palestine, as you will. The Palestinians live there today, the Arab people, uh, the Jewish people are living in the land. You know, it's very interesting to look back over the history of Israel. There have been only three times in thousands of years of recorded history when they've lived in a, in a, in a land of peace. The first was during the, what we call the golden age of the monarchy during Saul and David and Solomon. The second time when there was peace, even though they were under the control of the Romans, there was peace in the land and general prosperity. You know when it was? During the time when Jesus was born. In the fullness of time, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. When God's time was right. When there was a common Greek language and a variety of other reasons. During that time there was peace. When Jesus was born into this world, there was relative peace in the land of Israel. One of the first two times and only times in all of our history when Israel's not been so dominated by someone else and there, there has been conflict going on and wars and so on. You know when the third time is? Right now. 1948. By the way, just a quick little aside, the number 70 is a very significant number in the Bible. And if you add 1948 and you add 70 years to it, we're coming up on 70 years for Israel as a nation in a few years. And there are many in their country who often wonder, is something going to happen now after 70 years in this 70-year period of time? Something interesting to think about uh, in the context of Bible prophecy. The dispelling of war. We hold this as our great hope, that in his earthly coming to earth, in his earthly reign, and his time here for those brief 30-some years, he introduces peace. His people, each of us, carry it, and one day it will ultimately be our experience in his second coming and the messianic reign in the millennial kingdom. There will only be full peace when Messiah comes again a second time. So our first point this morning, there's coming a time and these topics of hope, diffusing despair, delivering joy, dispelling war. Now, notice secondly in these very common famous verses, there is coming a person introduction of the messianic age in verses 1 to 5 and now Isaiah introduces to the people of Israel and to us and for Christians for 2,000 years verses 6 and 7 there is coming a person not just a time a messianic age that we get a taste of now and in the future but there's coming a person when Messiah comes a number of things will be ushered in in particular we have here his first coming in verse 6, and then his second coming in verse 7. In fact, I really would encourage you, if you like to write in your Bibles, just by Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, right off in the margin, first coming, and by Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, take a look at his second coming. We're going to use most of the bulk of the rest of our time here uh, to talk about his first coming, and take a look at these four cards that I have up on the screen here, these four posters uh, that are called in ancient times honorific throne titles. <laughs> honorific throne titles or titles that are given to a person who's on the throne to honor them. There are multiple names for God in the Bible. Most of his names are not his formal name. They're descriptions of who he is and his character. And we have four of them here. I've given you the Hebrew. Not that most of us can read Hebrew. Probably only a few can. But it's sometimes interesting to at least see that this is the language that the Old Testament, our Hebrew Bible, was written in. And there are four titles that are given here that are descriptive. And in these next few minutes, I want you during this Advent season to be thinking about, Lord, do I need from you during this time something 
of your character and your person in my life in these coming weeks that's reflected in these titles that describe who you are. They're not just titles. They're who the Messiah is. They're who God is. And so we take a look at these four. You have verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Uh, He's talking past tense here and referring to Isaiah's immediate context, and we won't go into some of the immediate application, but he's also speaking about the future when the Messiah would come, because later on we're told he's not just any sort of normal son, he's mighty God. Nobody during Isaiah's time that was God. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, his character, his being shall be called these four things. They're double words. Hebrew re- reads from right to left. Pele Yovaots. Pele Yovaots. Wonderful counselor is the first of these four titles that I want us to reflect on for just a few minutes. This word Pele, or wonderful, is a word that also can be translated extraordinary, surpassing, marvelous. Extraordinary, surpassing, marvelous. In fact, some of you may remember the story in Genesis chapter 18 where Abraham and Sarah are told they're going to have a baby and Sarah's barren and they're going, how in the world? This isn't going to happen. They're living in doubt and disbelief and so on. And finally, a statement is raised by Sarah regarding the child where she says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And that word hard is pele. And it means extraordinary, marvelous, wonderful. Is, if, is anything too pele for the Lord? Is anything too wonderful, too hard, too extraordinary? Is, it, is anything too marvelous or surpassing? The answer is no. Or in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6, that great psalm that many are familiar with and is so powerful in its opening phrases, Lord, you've searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You know where I'm at, every word in my mouth. It's hard. And I'm summarizing some of them. Then he gets to the end. Such knowledge is too pele, too wonderful, too extraordinary, too marvelous for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The Messiah, Jesus, who was born and we celebrate during This Christmas time is extraordinary, surpassing, wonderful. In his counsel, Pele Yovetz, his counsel. The word counselor is one who plans or gives counsel. One who plans or gives counsel. So a wonderful counselor is one who is extraordinary, surpassing, marvelous in their ability to give counsel. You look at the life and the ministry of Jesus after he's born, and people go, wow. He teaches as one with authority. He's different than the other prophets. People are amazed. They see him as a a miracle worker and one with authority and wisdom and knowledge, and we look to his life lived perfectly and dying perfectly as a sacrifice for us, but we look at his life and we say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to emulate him. I want to live in great wisdom like he does. And when he left planet Earth, he gave a promise. He said, when I go, I'm going to send someone who will be a counselor who will live in your heart and live in your life, the Holy Spirit. So for us who are followers of Jesus, this Christ child that we celebrate at Christmas time is a wonderful counselor. Where do we get wonderful counsel from him? We get it from his word. Amen? We get it by his Holy Spirit. You know where else we get it? We get it as we counsel one another. I appreciate the fact that we have Karen McMahon on our church staff and she works in biblical counseling. A number of us work with her when we work with couples and so on. It's available and a resource to our church body. But Karen's been great in reminding me and the other staff, every single one of us are biblical counselors. Every single one of us. When we're in relationship with one another, when we're talking to one another, when we're discussing life situations, when we're in small groups or many congregations or just doing life and we're having coffee and we're going, wow, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Any scriptures come to mind and we speak the word of God and we counsel one another. 
So very, very important. A second title that's given here, Mighty God. When we made this up during the week, and I only caught it this morning, we had Almighty on there. The Hebrew word is not Almighty. None of the translations have that. That was our bad, so we patched it off here. This should be a capital M. But Mighty God. El is the word for God. Gibor. El Gibor. Mighty God. What does it mean? Uh, in John chapter 8, verse 58, we have this interesting statement. John chapter 8, verse 58. Listen to these words. When Jesus is having a discussion with the Jews and, and having a discussion uh, with uh, some Samaritans and they're interacting back and forth and they're talking about Abraham, finally Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Some even today question, did Jesus ever claim deity? He claimed deity over and over and over again. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30, we read a similar kind of statement. Here again, the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Jesus says, one day there will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and he's declared himself as the Son of Man over and over again. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and with great glory, proclaiming himself to be God over and over and over again. Jesus is more than a miracle worker. He's more than a prophet. He's 100% man, but he's also 100% God in human flesh. When we think of El Gibor, Jesus being, the Messiah being a mighty God. I think of a God who is there with great power and protection. He's a mighty God to care for and to sustain us. Is that the kind of God you need during this Advent season? Not only one who can counsel in extraordinary ways, but one who can come alongside of you with power and might to be able to sustain. Yeah, but you don't understand. I'm just barely hanging on by a thread. I may not understand, but God understands. And He is a mighty God. Powerful in His might to be able to sustain and to save and to work in our hearts and in our lives. Here's another one. Avi Ad. Avi Ad. Everlasting Father third of these titles. Everlasting, the Hebrew word means, pretty obvious, one who will perpetually be father. You have a father wound? Almost all of us do. We are, those of us who are fathers and grandfathers, very far from perfect, and even in the best of circumstances and homes. There are father wounds along the way. And uh, for many of us, we've been deeply disappointed and wounded by our earthly fathers, and it has affected us to this very, very day. We extend grace and we recognize the fallen nature of our human earthly fathers. But then, during this Advent season, we hear one of these honorific titles of the Messiah, and we find out He's not only the Son of God. You may be thinking, well, yeah, you know, there's the Father and the Son. Jesus is the Son. Absolutely true. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Jesus said in John chapter 8, I and the Father are one. And so while He is the Son along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, they are everlasting Father, perpetually available to be the kind of Father that we would long for in a human Father we have in a perfectly divine Father. This communicates to us love and provision for how long? Everlasting, always. And perhaps we even see some of that in the love that many of us have had in aspects of our earthly fathers with whom we've had good relationships and we see 
the goodness of God even in that. And then this last one, uh, sar shalom. Many of you are familiar with the Hebrew word shalom. Here it is, shalom, shalom, sar shalom. Sar is prince and shalom is peace. Sar shalom, prince of peace. One who brings peace. When and where? Israel, turn towards me or you're going to deal with the Assyrian invasion. And they didn't. And there was no peace. Prophecy to the future in the first coming, there was peace in Palestine and Israel during the time when Jesus came. The person of peace. And yet, 2,000 years of lots of war and we go, peace, peace. Where's the peace? It's coming in his second advent, verse 7 of our text here this morning. The Prince of Peace, one who brings peace. Where does peace start? First and foremost, in a relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ. First and foremost, it is a vertical peace in a relationship with him. And then it's horizontal in our own hearts and in our relationships with one another. Jesus is our peace through the work of the cross and through trust and faith in Him, but then that peace gets extended out into our relationships with one another. It's the gospel that brings peace into my home when I'm whacked out and do stupid things. It's the gospel that brings peace into my marriage. It's the gospel that brings peace into my relationships when I live it out and it's being lived out. And it's that same gospel of peace that we bring into the world that's living in darkness and gloom and is longing for peace ultimately experienced in the millennial kingdom. So which of these four aspects of Jesus Messiah do you long for and need this morning? He's our hope. He's our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. He's our everlasting Father. He's our Prince of Peace. And then verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, the millennial kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This prophecy was the hope for Isaiah's time. It was the hope in the Messiah's birth. And it is our hope today. Father, I pray that as we think of the prophet Isaiah and what was written here and even next week as we reflect on another of his prophecies, I pray, Lord, that as we think of this one in particular, that we would receive great encouragement, comfort, and hope, that we would know that there is peace in you even when there is no peace around us and in our world. But we cling to the promise and the hope that one day the lion will lay down with the lamb and there will be peace when you come again a second time and usher us fully into your kingdom of peace. Encourage us, bless us, teach us, by your spirit cause us to ponder even the things we've heard and seen here this morning. And now, Lord, bless us with your presence and your peace as we go out into a dark world with the light of hope, we pray in Jesus' name.